Shefetima for that introduction. I almost didn't recognize myself. <laughs> um, let me just get my machine up here to run. Um, everywhere where we look today, we see little snippets of news in newspapers about uh, it, it, it drones doing this and uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, there are even companies in Cape Town which are considering to use drones to uh, deliver um, your uh, groceries or your books or your cup of coffee, whatever. And uh, so I thought that this would be um, a good subject to deliver um, because I believe that we are on the edge of a, a drone inversion in the physical uh, community. And I've been involved on and off with uh, drones and uh, ultralight aircraft for the past 20 years. And I wanted to share my experiences and reminisce a little bit about uh, drones. Let me just see how this works. I think it's this one. Um, I know there's a bit in my which I'm not supposed to do this. <laughs> right. The layout of my talk is going to be as displayed and following the thinkers Immanuel Kant and you know that spelled K-A-N-T and uh, <laughs> James Hutton to whom both are attributed the saying that the past is the key to the present or to the future. I will summarize my past experiences of, of my colleagues and myself at mostly the Council for Geoscience in terms of using small airborne platforms and light mode geophysical sensors. Some of this work is still applicable to today. Um, then I will discuss the possibility of having a dream um, UAV a machine which can record for five or six independent geophysical data sets simultaneously and what to do with this data. Hopefully this will give an idea of the way the industry is going and how to position yourself to gain maximum benefit out of this. Um, the layout that will be a little bit of an introduction and then I will, I will discuss these um, no, no, I'm still struggling to find the, the red dot. Where's the red dot? It's the red dot. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's it. I'm not going to let you find the road. There's nothing happening. Just. Oh, okay, good, good. Earth's 
scientists, and especially in Southern Africa, had to put on their thinking caps again and come up with new or better ideas and advances in how to measure geophysical parameters innovatively with drones. Uh, 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 I think um, I will also be able to show that just with the brain power here in this hall present, we could uh, today build the ultimate uh, drone, which I consider the one which can measure um, five or six um, parameters um, simultaneously, uh, uh, independent parameters. Uh, and I want to start off by saying whatever, that, that if you look at the upper left, for those of you whatever, um, that do this for bread and butter, that they will be in no more. So Gordon, um, <laughs> and you don't have to do this anymore. Uh, uh, drones will do magnetics and the frequency domain type letting it um, service in the future. Time domain and measurements on the ground, but especially squids will still be around for some time and um, similarly, I don't foresee a quick replacement for doing uh, gravity uh, on Mother Earth. But we may get humanoids uh, or robots uh, to perform that function for us in the future. If you look at the present developments in um, uh, the robots, that's, uh, I think, what will happen. Um, well, the result is hopefully going to be that there is more beer time for us later. Um, but that is only if we can keep our pesky clients uh, away from us. Um, just that to give you an idea how important drones are in the earth um, sciences, uh, um, according to the magazine Earth, um, the projection was in 2013 um, to have 70,000 new jobs um, uh, 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 created the liver in the US alone, which will bring an additional 13.7 billion US dollars. Um, the USGS, the Canadian GS, NASA, and um, the many other institutions are already using uh, drones for geological mapping and the monitoring of volcanoes, deforestation, the pollution, and so on. The famous Dr. Luis Leakey um, in the Trocatana in, in uh, Kenya. She is using uh, drones as a prospect for, for uh, hominid fissile, um, fossil allocations. Full blown paramagnetic surveys have already been flown in Canada using strong um, equipment. Um, in South Africa, our um, intrepid Dr. Lava Amiglio has already demonstrated to us his WASP and he, he brought the WASP out again. He told me last night uh, that he will be demonstrating it today. Um, let's only say no. <laughs> um, it is uh, supposed to have a capability of 15 kgs, if I remember that correctly. If it's not the case, then um, I uh, apologize. Um, another of the uh, people I interact a lot with is um, Ray from Rainsburg. And I don't know if I'm letting a secret out here that he has. Um, built uh, a prototype, very lightweight, standalone flux gate at the magnetometer with a data acquisition system and a GPS in a bird for a copter. So you can just pick this up there and go and do your survey. CSIRO, the now technical University of Western Cape, are but few of the organizations in South Africa who are um, working on drones and then RES in Cape Town, uh, Chorus and the D, I think they're also developing a, a 
to physical gravity with which can fly magnetic surveys. Um, so, what do we consider a, a drone for our use? I'm mainly looking at a UAV of a reasonable size and capability being within the affordable uh, reach of a smaller geophysical company. As I will show you, there are hundreds of drone types out there and we are really spoiled for uh, choice and you have huge pockets or whatever. You can purchase um, something which can carry anything that you like. Uh, it, can, it can be able to carry a full time domain loop that will lower to the carry um, uh, 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 gravity, radiometer, uh, anything. But, but I like to think of us as smaller guys, whatever. So the um, drone should be in the region a thousand US dollars to about twenty thousand US dollars. It should have a fairly um, sophisticated navigation system, a payload of between two and thirty kgs. And then, of course, the my, the my uh, re machine, I'm sure it's everybody else's also, is um, if we could put together a machine which can perhaps do MAG, SPEC, EM, uh, near infrared, uh, LIDAR, all these kind of things. Uh, that's my dream. So, what techniques are applicable um, to being? Uh, flown by drones, whatever, but assuming that we can have these lightweight and sensors, and it's the magnetics, I think, is ideal. VOF and the frequency domain EM, and perhaps um, a ZTEM type uh, uh, equipment where your, your the, the receiver coils. Um, um, have a very high sensitivity and uh, but are lightweight. Okay? The, the key word is always lightweight. Um, time domain EM, we would struggle to overcome the drag on the transmitter coil. Um, um, but if uh, a small uh, robin telepocket can fly with the transmitter, then I think there is definitely also a drone with one of these quadcopters or octocopters which would also be able to, to do that. Um, gamma ray spectrometry. At the moment our sensors are getting lighter as I will show, but um, there are new possibilities with graphene which, which I will come to. No, that's near infrared. Um, Swear is um, shortwave infrared, and TER is thermal infrared spectrometry. The equipment has already been developed for the drone, the market. Um, um, unfortunately, it is still quite expensive, but the price will come down, I'm sure. Aperture uh, radar is a possibility. I'm not going to talk about aperture um, radar. Um, but it is certainly um, something which, which can also be considered. LiDAR, the latest LiDAR equipment is very uh, amenable to, to, to small uh, drones. Uh, and then uh, in, in gravity, uh, I think we have the Lockheed Martin, which at the moment, um, the FTGG, which I think is the, the lightest um, gravity gradiometer around. I hope, I hope I'm not offending somebody else. <laughs> um, good, so where did this all start? Um, I think I can say later that in 1994, I and my colleagues at the Council for Geoscience, we were the first persons in um, Southern Africa to have flown a, um, a model aircraft um, um, with a flux gate megatometer. Um, on the screen here you see uh, 
this aircraft that belongs to Hardy, you um, don't have any, any, any father, and um, Hardy was a, um, a electrical engineering student at Stucky, and that was his project to fly this uh, aircraft made out of balsa wood, and, and it had to fly to a location, take a photograph, and um, come back. So what we did is we piggy back onto that layer and we uh, added a um, flux gate with a magnetometer which was in those days built by Manfred Hauger. Manfred Hauger was my chief electronics um, engineer. So what we could what could we do in those days? We had a 30 minutes endurance, we had uh, a radio control, we had a real-time video feed to a laptop, so you could see um, uh, below you, uh, or below the aircraft, um, the way the aircraft that was flying. Uh, it was also, there was a, uh, a real-time GPS feed, to the laptop screen and there was a little map and you could plot the way you were going and then of course we had this flux gate which was unsightly the continuous. Um, but it soon turned out that ever that what we thought was going to be easy it was not easy because the servo motors on these little aircraft at that time they were extremely noisy, they eclipsed um, the uh, um, magnetic field or whatever. Also, there was a lag so between the video feed and the laptop and on, on two occasions that we flew into a tree and Hardy wasn't very happy about that because his also aircraft came second and uh, yeah, so. Um, and another problem which we didn't foresee was that we thought it was ideal to take off among, uh, from tower roads behind the university, but just the, the culverts or the uh, embankments caused huge turbulence there, which, which um, was a, a problem to, to uh, overcome. So, uh, as a result, we decided to, to switch to um, uh, auto light aircraft for the moment, and um, we had to develop or uh, include everything into the aircraft into a, uh, a weight budget of uh, 80 kgs, which at that time was quite difficult to do. I'm talking 20 years ago. Okay. But, some of these concepts are still uh, available at the day. Then. So, um, I'm just quickly going to show you some results of there. Uh, high density, that they have an ultralight. You have, some of you have seen these things before. And then we, um, sodium iodide was too heavy for us. So, 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 so we switched to PGO at some stage with the help of um, the uh, two eminent um, scientists from the University uh, of Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, um, and uh, that's what we had. Um, we 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 um, um, standardised on the Chaparu aircraft, and what we did is uh, because we switched from um, sodium iodide at the DGO, so we could um, reduce our, our camera spectrometer the weight that we had a near infrared profiler in the aircraft, which, um, if you compare it to the hyperstar, which was the cutting edge um, technology at that time. Um, we had a, uh, a weight of the reduction of that whatever. Also very important, uh, the, the, the fixed wing aircraft, uh, the larger 
between the aircraft, the uh, operating costs were at, at that time about 3,000 rand an hour. That went down to 180 rand an hour. And then we had this geometrics magnetometer, um, like plug and play, um, uh, which we used. There was no uh, RABS in the beginning uh, because it was just no space inside. Uh, um, just quickly, the, 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 the cockpit of the aircraft, um, uh, we had a uh, weather radar, the whole the DAS that was built into here, the pilots did everything. He flew the aircraft, he managed the data acquisition, the uh, spectrometer crystal was next door, and we were on the floor there. My team in those days, to which I want to pay homage, um, because without them, and it would not have happened, and uh, Patrick Calvin was our, our um, software person, the month of Hauger, uh, Trevor Geist and his two sons, they were two pilots, um, Trevor was the party chief, John Culper, another electronics guy, he always travelled with the aircraft or something, um, uh, it wasn't working correctly, it was his job, and then he could see her. Um, our uh, gamma ray expert, and then of course the Mr. Ray von Rensberg, whatever, who, who um, came up with many innovative designs. Um, um, and um, also played a huge role, but he wasn't present at, um, on that day. Um, Just old one kilometer data, still be the line spacing data, and then um, if you look in there, there's a small little area with a yellow line there and um, ultralight data um, from there. So that's in the line spacing. This is also flown at that level aircraft. Um, Spectrometer experimentation um, with, with uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Mayer and uh, Han Dunberg, Dr. Han Dunberg, I think he is here. Um, um, that's where our experimentation started. Um, just quickly, PGO against. Uh, PGO against art. You can see that there is a problem. PGO is much more um, um, smeared out, but in a way you can correct that with uh, uh, deconvolution. Um, just using a, a real laser altimeter. Um, um, that was a survey which we flew for Tet of Ebola in um, Namibia. And you can see the, um, the sand dunes, whatever. Um, people, in fact, the, the warn me in the beginning, don't buy a laser alternative because they don't work properly. Well, as you can see, they work properly. And just by the by, and the Eagle is also developing its own, their own IFC. Okay, um, so what could we do in those days? Better? Um, that is the strange image of the um, um, the Stowain uh, crater in Victoria, the magnetics, the magnetics of the UN. To remove the background field there. Uh, potassium map with PGO, thorium with PGO, near infrared, near infrared. That, that was, um, I think, uh, 1200 nanometers, and this was like 
uh, 14, 15 nanometers. But we had um, 1,024 channels between 200 and, and, and 16, uh, 1,650 nanometers, which you could combine any way you want. And if you overlay all these data sets, then in fact, you can start mapping the geology. Um, you can see here uh, the tree of the crater rim of the Swain crater, how uh, it is moving downwards a little bit, okay, and uh, uh, the, 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 the brine pool in the middle, and then this is another type of geology, so, this is, um, so I think the geologist has this sort of coverage up um, in the front because before he goes into the field, you know, he can already um, to make the decisions and that is why I um, advocate having as many um, uh, um, uh, independent measurements as possible. Um, another example that was we flew for the beers, and I hope I'm allowed not to show this data, which is years after the flat era. This is the well known. The, the, the mass contained kimberlite was the richest kimberlite ever discovered. Um, if you look at the geology, that is just a uh, granite, it's mapped as a granite. Uh, if you look at the gamma ray spectrometry, you will see there is lots of action here. The kimberlite, the dumps, there are other interesting things here. You see the banding in the granite. If you look at the near infrared <coughs> spectrum, and it's also and it's a uh, 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 composite image, you can see that the, the Himalayan in fact, the dumps, you can see the test uh, dark. Okay. There, there you can see it sort of just, um, uh, just appearing. Okay. And then there is also this banding which you get in the uh, camera spectrometry. If you look at the actual magnetics, um, there is no magnetic anomaly associated with the book, the muscle thing, but, and the, the digital uh, terrain of the model. Um, um, just quickly, um, so, what do you do with all this data? I mean, those days, we, um, that we had a look at the spectrum, and uh, um, I decided to try something called binary uh, encoding, which is a long process. But if there are any young people here who want to, to, to work on an ABC or PhD, this can be much improved. Um, using this um, spectrum, I, I create a sort of a binary. Um, the, the master and the spectrum, which which I then <coughs> used to look for similar uh, type um, uh, behavior, and of course, first you have to remove this sort of, and it's called a regional effect, and you are only in the, uh, interested in the, in the noise, in fact. Um, Using that um, and uh, training on these two areas, um, um, I can, in fact, I could pick up the Kimberlite signature, uh, the dumps, and this is the Stoyan crater. This is a type of uh, uh, granite which, which is in the caldera and so on. Uh, the migrant, okay. Uh, just another example of um, no imaging, whatever, and uh, we could pick up uh, value channels which might be uh, of interest to the uh, real kind figures. And then, of course, um, you know that in the past, um, that we also 
the political uh, right white time to my immune system. Um, this was never uh, uh, implemented at the theological survey, but I used that later um, in Yemen with a new prospect for Shia zones. Um, I have talked about that before. Okay. Um, so, this, the study of the art of 2005 at CGS was we, we could do all these things, whatever, but I Unfortunately, I could not fit my time domain onto a, se a session of caravan, which I bought specially for that purpose because I left in 2005. But um, I take my hat off to Steve Harker. Um, then it was Fidel, and now it's called uh, the CGG. He did that whatever, and today it, it, it is on Tempest, and I've used it a Tempest in Mauritania, and it works beautifully. So, then we had the weight reduction in gamma and uh, spectrometry. And what, what I didn't foresee at the time when it was that um, had it been able to do this, and then uh, and it created a need for fast computational um, software because. Your client would see the, the, the little aircraft, or he's going to see now the, 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 the drone flying over his property. And the next day, he wants to know, where's my day card? What have you seen? So, so uh, um, uh, in 2005, uh, that's already active, 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 whatever, and he has got um, impressive um, software using multiple data clusters, um, statistics, that is the frequency of my EM, and then there was compact volume inversion, um, which I've talked about before. That's just, that's, that's my boxy, okay? That's my boxy. <laughs> Long before. Okay. Good, so let's go uh, to the dream machine, and we already have a type of uh, uh, dream machine, and we also have a Frenchman here with his Matiki uh, cap on, so, and he's going to show us his dream machine, but uh, I'm going to show you my dream machine. Okay, um, we are spoiled for choice. Okay. If you want to go for fixed wing, that is going to be your dream machine. If, if you like these um, cup copters, whatever, this is called a hexar decup copter. Uh, it's got 16 um, um, uh, of these rotors, and this was developed in Germany. This is a German um, um, engineering student deliver. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you can have them large, you can have them small. That is the NASA fixed wing uh, aircraft which they are using now to monitor um, some volcanoes in the world. It takes up automatically, does what it has to do, comes back. This is from Sweden. Um, these guys are, are in the uh, quarry and they just want to measure it every day how much of the spotting material they have produced, you can launch your uh, uh, drone by a little catapult and it goes and uh, does a LIDAR on the server and comes back. Um, that is also uh, in Sweden. Um, this one, of course, is taken off the internet. Um, they launch it by hand and it comes back. It uses LIDAR and the photography and uh, that's what it is. That's what you want to do. Impressive. It's really. Oh, what's that thing now? Oh, <laughs> no. oh yeah, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one here is a Canadian um, aircraft. Um, it's got two um, um, negatometers, and I think um, they are they are um, Centrix um, <laughs> the, the, the negatometers. I cannot remember. Um, but 
this aircraft takes off. Uh, the, the, the flight path is, I mean, it's loaded previously uh, and it takes off, goes into the, 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 the measurements, comes back. Um, you know, some specs on it four meter wingspan, 100 cc, two stroke engine, differential, impressive differential to GPS system, better than one meter, and the laser altimeter, and it's got a, a iridium a satellite system, it's got a the proprietary uh, DAS, um, uh, and it can take a, a variety of payloads, I think it's up to 25 gauges, I mean, I mean it's 100 meters, uh, the takeoff and landing, um, it could be uh, endurance, 10 hours, okay? And um, what I found quite impressive was that it's got a fuel sponge, it's a new type of development endeavor in which the fuel is stored, and so it, it is a crash, but it, um, um, you will not see a lot of the sparks on the flight. I mean, in terms of copters and choppers, if you go onto the internet, you can have anything you want. This is a this is called the, um, the Behemoth. Um, it's a huge uh, copter, and then you have these small ones which go onto uh, the palm of your hand, and then the, it's only a uh, helicopter. This is my favorite one because it can take up it can pick up 50. KG, so if you see the price, then um, you, you, you will immediately lose interest. Um, <laughs> this is more for the, um, let's say, people in uh, the next pay grade, uh, the, the, the one above me. Um, but again, look at the specs, you know, it's, it's, it's um, It's got two turbine engines, um, of which only the, the, the one operates at a time. I mean, you can fly a whole um, mission for you, and, and uh, 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 you can fly up to 2,000 meters. Uh, so impressive, really impressive. Okay, um, that, that's a behemoth. But it is not about the platform, it's about the instrumentation. Okay. Um, both Geometrix and um, Centrix, they have developed a small scale um, season vapor sensors. And they are, I mean, for this drone, the market. But watch out because drones also still cause noise, so despite the, the small size or whatever. Um, there is still a problem. These are actual um, surveys which were flown uh, three years ago uh, in Canada with that. Um, it's been, uh, I'll, uh, I'll show to you. Um, the, the miniature the LIDAR. Okay. Um, yeah. That's what you can do with a lot of them. My favorite is the um, Spesum uh, infrared, which is available now, and it's also uh, 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 it has the night owl. Um, that they are the uh, a continuous range, okay, uh, at uh, at room temperature, no uh, cooling down. Then there is the graphene. Um, um, it has a, a, an electrical the response has been discovered if it's struck by gamma rays, and hopefully the Japanese will be able to, 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 to solve uh, that problem for us and to build us a lightweight gamma ray spectrometer. Okay, then um, the lightweight EM sensors, um, our uh, intrepid ray from Rendsburg, the ESA, whatever. And uh, we are looking at this. We have a number of prototypes which we're looking at. 
not as impressive yet as the uh, Armored by the Giants McKnight, but um, hopefully with a bit of um, loving care and attention to, to we can get to that and get to something that, which we can use on the drug. Um, but there is William uh, Teskan, um, he is already um, um, the, the more advanced, this is from the Piper um, in 2012, he is already flying the BOF, the, 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 the helicopter. Gravity, gravity is the one technique which puzzles us a lot of it, and the, so you have these two ways here, right? you can either um, to, to measure it like that, which is a white on the spring. I'm going to run this two minutes late. Okay. Or, or you're going to have uh, the gravity um, the gradient. I think that's been um, solved uh, to a large extent by Lucky Martin and uh, 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 Jedix, but. Um, we still need to bring down the weight, and uh, uh, but if you look at the ordinary um, the gravity meter, that, that is just a schematic for the you know, Costa Rombers, and, and, and is the one which which um, the Saunders is flying, and it's just a weight on the on the, on the screen here. So just just to be. Um, uh, to um, um, entice you to put your thinking caps on, um, it's going to be a long time before somebody like myself or whatever could afford a, a, a lucky the modern um, um, radiometer or whatever. So I want to challenge the young people in this, I mean this audience, to to come up. With with a new uh, 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 innovative idea or whatever. This was something I had to evaluate uh, some time ago. It was called uh, Gravit. And uh, what this guy proposed was that we, that we had a look at how the wings flap. Okay? And if you could measure the flexure in the wings, um, uh, it would get sort of a very disturbed that and I mean, if you take all the averages thing, his idea was that, that perhaps that would be an indication of the gravitational contraction. I, of course, I turned this down, but um, I mean, sort of I mean, intrigued me that somebody else would think of this idea. Okay, just a quick word on the current demonstration in South Africa. Um, if you want to fly a drone, you need to have a license these days. Um, if you want to go beyond your backyard, you need now to lodge a flight plan. The license costs 15,000 rand or whatever. You are still limited uh, to uh, psychic uh, limitations and you need to be a proven um, uh, recipient of uh, and insurance coverage. So, in summary, um, the magnetic LiDAR and there, all these things, um, they are commercially available and they can be installed on the appropriate UAV. UAVs, despite their small size and the materials, they still cause noise, which I think taken into account when I'm installing the above the sensors. Um, since the release of Armit, Lots of activity in developing small, little, lightweight, even sensors. And I think that this uh, pricing versions of the soon for market. Extreme lightweight gamma ray spectrometry is still at least one or two years away. Uh, VLF, ZM, will, will probably be available in the next year or 18 months. Time domain, I believe. Um, uh, the drag on the loop is going to be a problem, but perhaps the one could just use the drone to fly the receiver. Um, 
Large drones can handle uh, gravity radiometers, but we are also still looking for an out of the box idea. Um, I'm sure at some stage um, somebody, a um, young um, student, is going to come up with an uh, idea and, and everyone's going to say, like, why don't we think of that? Um, commercial software. Um, uh, um, with, with all this data coming together, um, we are going to use what we need data to, to combine all this information. But luckily for us, uh, Dr. Ebele and Professor Parsha, they have already seen this gap in the market, and um, perhaps in the next year or so, we will have some um, software that can handle. Uh, all these other sets. And I sincerely hope that you saw in traffic, Maxwell, and NCOM, that was the one which I didn't remember when I, when I did this. <laughs> um, they are also are aware of that and they have the, the edition in place. Yeah, there will be new opportunities with the knowledge uh, triangles in 3D, the modeling and, and, and versions and so on. Lots that we talked about here. New, many new opportunities in the right of data collection and implementation, but it will eat into the lower end of the, of the, the physical A1 market. And that's the end, ladies and gentlemen. I um, hope I uh, didn't talk to you. Uh, uh, National Society of Applied Geophysics. It is a not-for-profit organization that promotes the science of geophysics and the education of applied geophysicists. SEG exists to connect, inspire, and propel the people and the science of geophysics. It fulfills its mission through its publications, conferences, forums, educational opportunities, and multiple website resources. Dr. Elijah Ayulabi was born in Nigeria, where he received a bachelor's degree in engineering physics, a master's degree in geophysics, and a PhD in geophysics. He has 25 years of experience in teaching seismology, general physics, well logging, and formation evaluation, electrical gravity, magnetic and electromagnetic methods of geophysical exploration, environmental and engineering physics, and near-surface geophysics. He started his career with Ogun State University. He then joined the University of Lagos as a lecturer and later as a professor. Professor Ayulabi has, in addition, visited being a visiting professor at the Shaw Center of Excellence in Geoscience and Petroleum Engineering at the University of Benin, where he served as head of academics and as research advisor. He has supervised more than 100 postgraduate research, researchers covering varied aspects of geophysics, including near-surface geophysics, potential field method analysis, environmental and engineering geophysics, borehole geophysics, seismic acquisition, processing and interpretation, basin evaluation and core pressure prediction and analysis, to name a few. Professor Ayalabi has published four books, numerous contributory chapters, two books, and in excess of 60 articles. 
He is a reviewer and associate editor for numerous geosci geosciences journals. Professor Ayulabi has implemented and supervised the diverse projects for many recognized organizations, government agencies, and for the private sector. He has been the recipient of the Nigerian Association of Petroleum Explorationists Shell Award in 2002 in recognition of the effective development of quality education in Nigerian tertiary institutes. In 2013, Professor Ayulabi was named American Association of Petroleum Geophysicists, the Geologists, and the Nigerian Association of Petroleum Explorationists, Young Faculty Advisor of the Year. He is an active member of both associations and in addition holds membership to the Nigerian Mining and Geosciences Society, the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, and the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers. I would now like to call upon the esteemed professor to deliver his talk on Near Surface Geophysics, a High Fidelity Tool for Engineering, Environmental and Hydrological Problems. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, to become an associate, 
You just go to this website and then you can stay there. Today, we're talking about high fidelity, um, near surface geophysics, a high fidelity tool for engineering, environmental, and ecological problem. Uh, and for us to do that, uh, there may be need for me to actually let us know what near surface geophysics is all about. And in doing that, I quickly take us through uh, definitions given by uh, these three people. The first one is given by Ifred, which says application of geophysical method for studying the uppermost tens of meters beneath the air surface. Uh, this is regarded as a near surface geophysics by Ifred. I am a buffer. It says that near surface geophysics uses the investigation method of geophysics <laughs> to study the near the nature of the very utmost part of the earth crust. And if you go to Wikipedia, it says that near surface geophysics is the use of geophysical method for a, to investigate the small scale features and the shallow uh, tens of meter within the subsurface. And in essence, you will see that near surface geophysics generally deal with the application of geophysical method in investigating uh, the shallow part of the earth. Some water have taken the first uh, 100 meters to be the near surface. Some has gone to the extent of about 300 meters uh, to be the near surface. Uh, whichever one is your option. Uh, the bottom line is that our focus is within the uppermost part of the earth. And this is the region of dynamic activities within the, the subsurface. Uh, the region that have witnessed intense human activities in terms of structural development, in terms of excavation, in terms of creating rules for different types of uh, operations. So, uh, what is the significance of this near surface to us as a geophysicist? Number one is that it supports all forms of life, uh, whether human, animal, or plant, the existence, anchor on the existence of this uh, near surface. It also serves as a host for mineral resources and is a reservoir contaminant. Uh, whatever the contamination uh, product of human activity is actually stored within this near surface. It provides the economic base. In actual fact, nations of the world derive their economic growth from this uh, near surface. Most of the solid mineral around the world are involved or reside within the near surface. Thus, it is the root for human and national development. And the last part of it, uh, whether you believe it or not, uh, that is your last school. Uh, yeah, you eventually have to decide uh, at the end of the day. So therefore, uh, this near surface is very important. And from here you see that the near surface then over uh, physical properties that can be measured using the physical method. So, what are those physical tools that can be deployed in near surface investigation? One of them is what we call gravity method. Uh, this is a popular method that can be deployed for near surface investigation. This actually anchors its operation on the two basic law. The first one is the Newton universal law of gravitation, and then the second, which is the Newton second law of motion. Uh, these two laws combined together uh, can be used to derive the expression for gravitational relation within the air surface. And basically, in gravity method, we measure spatial relation and in gravity as we move from point to point on the surface of the earth. And then directly, we are measuring the relation in density, which can then be used to deduce information about the nature of the subsurface. The second one is the magnetic method. For magnetic method, we did the variation in geomagnetic field as well as the magnetic susceptibility uh, within the earth surface. Uh, Over time, these two methods are combined in order to divide uh, the subsurface uh, structure and I find useful application in investigating the near surface. Another method is the electrical method. For electrical method, we have the spontaneous potential method, the induced polarization method, and then the electrical resistivity method. For spontaneous potential method, the focus is on the perturbation in the potential field of the earth as we move from point to point. For electrical resistivity method, uh, 
This has to do with the contrast to the electrical property uh, within the air. And we have found that uh, we have what we call the 1D, uh, which is made up of uh, the vertical electrical sanding and then the profiling. The vertical electrical sanding, the interest is the duration of the resistivity in the dead uh, with respect to the fixed point, whereas in profiling, this is uh, the interest in the duration of the resistivity, lateral duration of the resistivity with respect to a fixed dead. Uh, within the given uh, study area. Uh, this has actually developed over years to become what we call a 2D electrical resistivity tomography, in which you can see both the XY variation of the resistivity uh, within the subsurface. The development of technology has also helped to improve this and then become a 3D electrical resistivity tomography. In actual fact, as you know, that the art is three dimensional in nature. Uh, whatever study that we actually depict the structure of the earth must also be three dimensional. And beyond that, the electrical resistivity tomography has also developed to, uh, to the point that can be deployed in marine uh, investigation. Unfortunately, unlike uh, the gas method, uh, this cannot be used in the air uh, because of the high electrical resistivity. And, uh, Another method of investigation which is of relevance in near surface investigation is the electromagnetic method. And basically, we have the time domain, the frequency domain, and then the ground penetrating needle. Uh, for the time domain, the coil is energized and it's suddenly cut off. Uh, if there is contrast in the conductivity within the subsurface, it's such that uh, an eddy current that's set up will in turn generate a consequential decay in the magnetic component of the electromagnetic field within the air. And this can be measured over a given period of time. For the frequency domain, this has to do with the duration of the conductivity with frequency. And for this, usually your air wave is spread out in all directions. Uh, some cut through the air, some cut through the subsurface. Those that cut through the subsurface, when it comes in contact with the subsurface conductor, set up an eddy current within the conductor. This in turn generates a secondary electromagnetic field, uh, which will return back to the surface and can be picked up by the receiver cord. Uh, this can be used to reduce the formation of the subsurface. For ground penetrating leader, as you know, the Maxwell's equation has two components, uh, the displacement current component and then the conduction current component. Uh, for the ground penetrating leader, the displacement current component is of significant, the conduction component is uh, negligible within this region because of the high frequency required in ground penetrating leader. And this method has been very useful in near surface investigation and to provide solutions to some of the near surface problems and also act as a mitigating uh, method to provide relevant uh, solutions. Another method of relevance in air surface investigation is the seismic method. And for here we have a shallow reflection method, the refraction method, and then the multi channel analysis of surface field. In natural fact, uh, the engineering investigation of this thing uh, makes use of the multi channel analysis of the surface field. Now, what are the areas of application of this uh, geophysical tool? in near surface investigation. The first one is in groundwater investigation. In solving groundwater problem uh, in various geological uh, settings. For us to know how significant this is, we also need to understand the geological setting of the environment in which such method is to be deployed. And basically we have what we call the sedimentary environment in which the aquifer that serves as groundwater reservoir there is referred to as the core aquifer. Uh, in this case, it's a matter of depth. Uh, you show in the sedimentary environment, the, you have a very high percentage of getting water, but it's just a matter of depth and then the quality. Then, we look at how the uses are built of regulars in this. In the basement complex terrain, the story is not the same as what you have in the sedimentary terrain. In the sense that groundwater does not exist everywhere. So for such, you need to identify where you have fracture, rock contact, or fissures, or area of thick liquid that can support the groundwater accumulation and can be made available for human uh, consumption as well as industrial development. 
And the Dolomite and limestone environment, we have what we call a cast aquifer, in which the uh, limestone has been fractured, in such that uh, you have a secondary porosity that can have as a reservoir for groundwater pollution. So I give us a few case studies. Uh, we have deployed the geophysical method in solving a groundwater problem in some of this environment. Uh, for sedimentary environment, like I said before, it's a matter of depth. We can be sure that the aquifer exceeds uh, virtually everywhere, but it's a matter of depth. Uh, the depth in this area might not be exactly there, and then the quality. For basement, uh, for instance, if you take this stretch, in this area you might not find groundwater because it's the hard rock, the porosity and the permeability are almost zero or zero. And therefore, if you drain there, you are going to have a dry water. If you move to this area where you have a weathered material, yes, you may find groundwater, but it might not be sufficient. And particularly during dry season, this will give you a dry water. But when you drain it to fracture, uh, where you have sufficient groundwater accumulation, you don't have a productive uh, borrow. The duty of the offices in this area is to be able to identify such points that can uh, serve as a point where groundwater extraction can be carried out easily. So for such, we are finding this useful, vertical electrical sanding method, frequency domain, time domain, and 2D electrical resistance <coughs> to move have been very useful uh, in groundwater <coughs> investigation. And I'll give us key studies. One, for BES, we have this four electrical system, uh, two for potential, two for current. And as you can see there, we have the current, the outside electrodes, the potential, the inner two electrodes. Usually, we want to measure the potential difference across those two points, and it's given by this expression. And then we can derive the expression for the apparent uh, resistivity, uh, which can be budget to bend the resistivity duration with the subsurface with respect to the center of the electrode arm. Another method is the frequency domain EM34. Uh, this is the horizontal magnetic dipole. Even though you have vertical coil, the magnetic type is horizontal, so that it's vertical to that. And then here you have the vertical magnetic dipole, the coil is horizontal, but the magnetic field is perpendicular and is down into the subsurface. Here the depth of investigation is about 0.75 multiplied by the coil separation. Here is about 1.5 multiplied by the coil separation. Another frequency domain here method is BLA. Uh, uh, which can be used to identify a very large factor within the subsurface. Uh, this is the typical time domain EM setup, uh, which can also be used for groundwater investigation. And this is 2D. Uh, in contrast to the VEH, which is just uh, a single point investigation, for 2D, uh, this is what we see. You have several electrodes laid out, and then we can investigate the subsurface resistivity relation from one end of the electrode uh, to the other end. Uh, this will give us a gross picture of the distribution of the aquifer within the subsurface. So, case one, uh, this is a typical deployment in the sedimentary terrain, and then you have the topsoil, you have the clay that overlay in this aquifer, and then the design. Uh, in this case, it's very easy and simple, it's just a matter of uh, depth. You are sure you find the groundwater here. However, for the second case, uh, which is also sedimentary terrain, uh, you still have the three layers there, you have the top soil, you have the green. Uh, but you can see that this sand layer actually pinched out within this area. And therefore, if you drill in this area, even if you get water, the yield is going to be very low. And this underscores the significance of uh, uh, geophysics in finding stream point for groundwater investigation. Uh, this is a typical BS, and like I said, it just is this three point investigation. And therefore, it may not give you a gross picture of what the subsurface distribution is. This is an integrated method in order to find solutions to groundwater problems in a typical basement complex environment. Uh, the frequency domain here was carried out both for the vertical uh, dipole as well as the horizontal dipole, and this is what we see. And then we have identified the fracture within this point. And this is the 2D result. You can see also the fracture, and you can see the uh, 
uh, weather district in that area. After this, uh, this is an area in which the groundwater yield has been found to be very low. Uh, when this point was identified, the drillers were mobilized to the field, and then this point was identified for drilling. Uh, in the course of drilling, this is what we observe. You see this uh, water coming out of the zone pressure uh, because of the thick uh, fractal region in this place. Uh, this has helped to provide solution to groundwater problem in this environment. In a typical cast environment, uh, this uh, limestone bed, because uh, we have fracture here, which has created this uh, uh, cavity within this layer, uh, filled with uh, groundwater. And uh, these have become uh, conductive due to the mirror from the limestone. And therefore, you see it's characterized by a very low uh, resistivity. When this was opened up, this is what you see, and you can see the groundwater flowing up, and uh, the mine is already flooded. This has to be pumped up to some other area. Other area of interest is in the groundwater pollution, particularly in the environmental studies. And for that, we have the hydrocarbon, uh, which serves as a pollutant. We have the salt water incursion. We have leaching, uh, industrial effluents, uh, soccer pitch, mining activities, as well as uh, agriculture. All these uh, generate uh, material that uh, pollutes the groundwater. And this can be investigated using the office picture. Again, what happened as a result of all this reside within the first uh, 100 to 300 meters within the subsurface, and therefore the physics of relevance here is classified under the surface of geophysics. So it's a typical thing. Usually, water in a square form, that's what you have. Uh, but one activity uh, escalates the pollution. Uh, this is as a result of mining. Uh, this is a result of uh, waste disposal and then open land free site uh, which has scattered all over. So, uh, when this decomposed, it gives rise to what you call a leaching, which eventually percolates through the subsurface and contaminates the water and makes the water to be harmful uh, for human beings. For groundwater pollution due to carbon, uh, usually in our environment, we have uh, pipelines buried uh, in different parts of our country, and then this pipeline usually convey both the, the finished product with the PPMS as well as the crude. Uh, for finished product, we have some of these passing through different areas. Now, if there is no problem, this will continue. But when there is corrosion and there is a leakage within this pipe, there is no problem. Or as a result of finalization, the pipeline is destroyed and uh, such that an opening is created within that. They will find that the flow of uh, uh, the PPMs, uh, which over time uh, will find a way and they pollute the aquifer. Eventually, travel down to where you have the aquifer and continue to spread. And as the groundwater extraction continues to increase, maybe due to human activities or whatever, uh, this will also continue to flow. And then the uh, area ordinarily does not have produced uh, uh, polluted water. We begin to pollute, uh, produce polluted water. And this is what we have seen uh, in some of the area. Now, this is a typical occurrence. This is a result of visualization. Uh, this is a result of uh, incomplete or bad completion of the uh, hole. And this is a this from there. And then these are spills all over. This eventually uh, produces the groundwater. I will see the example. This hole was drilled uh, in order to extract water. Uh, however, a few days after completion, uh, EPMS was being pumped from this hole. We also have some other ones. Uh, this pit was dug as a soak away pit, but 24 hours later, you see the petroleum product. Not because they are producing oil from this area. Here's another one. Uh, harmful to the aquatic life. And this is a typical one. Uh, we had, when the hole was opened up, this is what was found there. Here's another area uh, where this was drilled. Uh, this is an open uh, adult well. 
And then after some time, crude uh, was coming out of this place, crude oil. Uh, this is another hand up well. This is what we find from the hand up well. Instead of water, you have uh, PPMS. And this is a typical one which has to be sealed up after some time. Now, I asked the physicist here of Redivan in order to find the plume from such area. In addition to 2D electrical resistivity tomography, 3D electrical resistivity tomography has been of relevance, particularly in groundwater pollution studies. For the PPMS we see that time, 3D electrical resistivity tomography was deployed to investigate the area, and after the inversion of the result, this area was opened up, and this is what we find there. It took three months to remove this area, to pump it out. This is another area, uh, this was a pipeline, it's been there for about 25 years, but later a next stage was set up within this area. Uh, within that period, there have been a series of activities of funders within this area, uh, in which the pipeline has been disrupted, and then there have been leakages. However, this was not manifest until there is a settlement in this area, uh, when the groundwater withdrawal continued to increase, and then the hydrocarbon find its way into this area. And this is what we see there. You can see the hydrocarbon plume from different survey lines in that area. 3D deployment was also done, and you can see the exact plume within that area uh, of the hydrocarbon. In the subsurface, the typical area uh, where you have the refineries, the pipelines pass through that area. For this is what we see, for that we find it. And for this area, we find this. Uh, not only that we've been able to identify the flume here, this has also helped us to, uh, in one way or the other, identify the possible flow direction. Because we cannot see the IRS 3D signature within this environment. And give us the, uh, the flows within that uh, environment. Another area of application is in salt water incursion. Uh, usually, there's material balance, you have fresh water there. And yet we have the short uh, water from the Atlantic or from the ocean. If you do here, you find fresh water. But as the amount of fresh water withdrawal continues to increase, uh, the ocean water will find its way uh, in order to uh, create a balance and into that. And so that will lower the pressure and that will lead to the uh, water extraction drop level. So in a typical area in Nigeria, this is what we have. We have the Atlantic here, and then we have the lagoon, uh, and then this uh, settlement, the residential area. Okay, uh, uh, because of the interaction of the Atlantic water, as well as the, uh, the salt water from the Atlantic, and then the brackish water from uh, the lagoon, uh, this area is under constant influence of uh, groundwater being polluted, and as uh, the settlement increases years before. At 45 meters, you can find the fresh water. But as of today, you have to dig to about 145 meters to 150 meters before you can find fresh water in this area. What has happened is that as the amount of fresh water will dry in this area in places, uh, the salt water from the Atlantic finds its way in, and then the brackish water from the lagoon finds its way in, in order to fill in the gap. Uh, the so uh, that's typical of the area. As the amount of water will dry in places, also the salt water in consumption in places. So, in this area, we have uh, deployed diffuses, and as you can see, as you move inward, the salt water interface uh, decreases. But as you move towards the ocean, uh, you see the increase in the salt water interface and the depth here, as compared to what you have here. Uh, this is to tell you that the geophysics can be of relevance to actually uh, identify the salt water, fresh water interface, and can monitor groundwater uh, in person uh, due to the salt water emission. But will be a typical way of actually clearly delineating this. However, don't forget, bow is expensive uh, in order to do. And how many are you going to drill in such an area for regular constant monitoring? And therefore, Geophysics is of relevance in such an area. And this is what we have done. Uh, this is 2D electrical activity tomography. And as you can see, 
and this is the goal law for the area you have your gamma and then you have your restivity. The restivity log is characterized by a low restivity signature. And as you can see from the 2D, you have the low restivity signature here. And you can see the brackets, salt water, fresh water interface, clearly marked. So you can have this gross picture using the physics rather than just a one point uh, or discrete point ball drilling, uh, which is much more expensive than deploying a geophysics. Other area of pollution is what we call leachate impact uh, due to the composed refuse material. Uh, this is actually a leachate pond here. Uh, from the Google, you can clearly see it. This is the top side. I've been there for about 25, 30 years, and the fume uh, accumulates in this area. What happened before? Uh, fresh water has been extracted there and there. But over a period of time, uh, the leaches find its way into the subsurface and create the groundwater polluted, and the region of fresh water now produces uh, polluted uh, water due to groundwater uh, pollution as a result of leaching. So this was well. Now, how can the physics be deployed in this area? I find that for this, integration is the best answer. And therefore, we can deploy both the 2D RT, the electromagnetic method in such an environment. This is a typical case study. Uh, we are the, the 2D RT as well as the EM method has been deployed. And for such, this is what we have. And you can see the leaching pool. You can see the migrating part even for the leaching within such area. Characterized by very low restivity signature uh, due to the high part of the leaching. And to a depth of almost 60 meters, this region has been packed by the decomposition of the material. For EM response, this is what you see. Very high EM response. The EM is about, uh, about 300 millisiemens per meter, almost the same there. Uh, you can see it's about 200 millisiemens per meter. However, similar thing was done in the control environment. As compared to 300, you have less than 25 millisiemens per meter, uh, which shows the high impact of the uh, leaches in the groundwater and such environment. And don't forget, uh, investigation there is up to about 60 meters, and you can see in the 2D RT that also depicts the same thing. This is another example. Uh, here we have the bow dog, uh, this is the aquifer. The first, and then you have the aquifer there. Uh, for this, this year response, you can see very low, it's about 25, uh, it's about 23 here. Yeah. Now, for such, this is the 2D here, we have two response. You can see clear, clearly marketed the aquifer here and this place, which correlates well with the bow of However, for the polluted region, what we see, this was the fire. Very high EM response, over 700 millisiemens per meter. Uh, close to 700 millisiemens per meter, 350 millisiemens per meter. And 2D, uh, this is the log again. You can see this is characterized by low restricted signature, the neighborhood of about 0.76, uh, which shows the extent of the groundwater pollution uh, in this area. The same here and then the same here. So, uh, extracting water from this aquifer shows clearly that the water here will be patterned by uh, the leaching material. Another area of interest is in uh, very utilities, uh, very pipes, cast aquifer uh, cavity within the subsurface, uh, which reside close to the surface. The physics are being already done. For that, you have the DPR, that is the graph electrical radar, you have the 2D gravity, you have the microgravity survey, uh, which can be deployed. A typical result from some study uh, is buried utilities, and these are DPR response for this and that. And then if you exaggerate a bit, you find this uh, clearly there. 2DRT was also deployed with things like that, and uh, you can see region of contrast in uh, resistivity. Uh, we try to mark that. Uh, then 
we correlate that with the DPR, is what you see. Uh, the last point here cannot be clearly computed on the DPR. But what this one you see? Uh, this is the point, this is the 3D response, this is the 2D response, this is the DPR response. Uh, you have the RSTVT because this, uh, even though this is a pipe, but you have air inside, and therefore the RSTVT signature. You see in that there. So, uh, it's very chiller pipe also, you have similar response. Other area of application is in engineering site assessment. Usually, for engineering site assessment, we have different types of settlement. Uh, some we cause craft, some will not. For uniform settlement, uh, there may not be any major problem because the structure goes down at uniform rate and therefore there will not be craft. Uh, we also have another type which is a tipping settlement. Uh, for this, there may be craft. Uh, depending on the rate through which the structure is going down. So, uh, you have that. So, at times there are no cracks. But the major one is what you call differential settlement, in which the structure goes down at uh, no uniform rate. And therefore, that leads to crack. And this is what you see. Uh, now, typical examples uh, this structure is already teaching towards that edge, and eventually, you will have to grow down. So, this is a failure. It's also a form of failure to observe the growth. Uh, it's a typical one. This is Nigeria. This is also another area in Nigeria. This is Nigeria and this is Bangladesh. You can see here that the, the first law here is already submerged uh, due to the settlement. So for that, you have find MLW to be of relevance as well as the 2D electrical instability tomography. If we integrate these two, we can deploy it uh, to study various period within the settlement. Uh, this is a typical one. This is a railway bridge uh, in the northern part of Nigeria uh, that has witnessed failure year in, year out. And then we deployed two DRT lines here and integrated that. This was the fun. Yeah, this correlates well with the CPT, the engineering test result. This is the competent layer. Unfortunately, beneath the competent layer, we have highly compressible material, which is responsible for the year in, year out failure of the rail line through this space. Uh, further integrated, uh, for the 3D structure of the area, this is what you find. This compressible material is responsible for the failure. Another area of interest uh, is here. Uh, this structure has been there since 1932, but the ocean tide has washed away some of the rock moves here. And then the sediment gets it covered. And then the land reclamation is taking place here now, where it becomes a problem to the engineer in order to get the pile down here because it's stop on the move. Now to identify where the moves are, uh, the microgravity as well as 2D gravity were deployed in this area. And this is what we find. Uh, this is for 10 meters, 5 meters spacing, 10 meters spacing. Unfortunately, the resolution here is 4, uh, similarly here. So we have to do what we call the vertical derivative, and then you can see clearly this rock move uh, identified having a high density. Uh, this correlates with the 2D RT in the area, and this is what we find. Uh, that's the correlation for it. Um, road failure is another area where I find the diffusions to be of relevant. And what we do uh, is the MBSW, you have to move from the time to be to the frequency to be in order to see the fundamental move and the dispersion. And this typical result. Uh, for this area, you see region of blue shear wave velocity, which shows the presence of highly compressible material uh, responsible for failure. It's also characterized by low resistivity material. Uh, and that's another area, you see that. And this is the 2D result. For this end, it's characterized by low resistivity signature. You can see the low MSW also, low shear wave velocity. Uh, in landscape investigation, we also have uh, 2D resistivity tomography, very useful. Uh, this is the shear and this is the limestone bed, as you can see there. Uh, 2D was deployed, and this is what you find. Uh, this is the limestone bed, uh, this is the shear on top of it. And that's as if a mineral exploration in our country. Uh, we also have for uh, uh, tar sand, we have this which is also characterized by high resistivity uh, signature. So, these are areas in which uh, diffusions have been employed. Uh, 
uh, yearly uh, to support the Guinea's official investigation. Thank you very much. towards our gala dinner. Headquartered in Batista, Maryland, Lockheed Martin is a global security and aerospace company that employs about 112,000 people worldwide. It is principally engaged in the research, design, development, manufacture, integration, and sustainment of advanced technological systems, products, and services. It is the natural resource, in the natural resource sector, Lockheed Martin provides the world's only deployed gravity radiometry systems for use in exploration and production monitoring applications. Dan De Francesco graduated with a BSc in mechanical engineering degree from Letourneau University in Texas in 1982. In his 28 years with Lockheed Martin, he has been responsible for the design, integration, testing, and support of complex gravity radiometer instruments and systems for submarine investigation, arms control treaty verification, and commercial mineral and hydrocarbon exploration. These roles have included serving as the chief mechanical engineer with the responsibility for mechanical design elements, environmental analysis, system integration, field testing of systems, and customer support. He has also served as program manager and technical director for numerous government and commercial programs, and is presently the business development manager for the Gravity Business Unit, located in Niagara Falls, New York. Dan is also responsible for coordinating Lockheed Martin's interests in the broader oil and gas sector. I would now like to call upon Mr. De Francesco to say a few words. Thank you very much. Um, it's really not me that's sponsoring this, it's uh, Lockheed Martin, but the theme that I really just want to emphasize again uh, as the conference is identified as breaking barriers, you're doing that right now, letting an engineer speak to you. So thank you for your indulgence. And uh, I'll just take a few minutes here to give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on in the world of technology and how it might apply to this space. I think you're going to give me a clicker at some point. theme again, breaking barriers. Well, I'll, I'll use the term challenges instead of barriers as we talk about what's facing us today in industry. Uh, obviously, there are economic challenges. Uh, this, this chart shows you that since 2011, there's been about a 16% decline in the revenue by the top 40 mining companies. We've also seen things like exploration budgets decrease. In 2014, it was down about 26%. Probably something similar here in 2015. We've seen the commodity metals price index decrease about 27% in the last year. Uh, we've seen uh, exchange rates work in some people's favor and to the disadvantage of others. So there's economic challenges that we face. Uh, you can look at the prices of various commodities and how they've declined. I can't think of one that's increased in the last year. So we're obviously in a difficult position. So with that gloomy overview economically, that's one challenge we have to face, but there are also just the, the realities of, of where we do mining, the geography of what happens. It's done in hard places. It's done in mountainous, desert locations. It's done in places that are severe and remote, hard to get to. Uh, maybe not all that enticing for people to want to go to, but uh, 
There are challenges from a geographic perspective. You know, the whole geopolitical question, and I use the little term here, all politics are local, but there are regional influences going on, there are national influences, state influences. Now, let's bring it down to our own personal lives. How many of you face political issues within your own companies, within your own departments? I mean, there are challenges there as we scrape and fight for budgets, as we try to maintain some relevance in a very difficult place. So there's a few political issues. There's the technical challenges. Targets are getting smaller, targets are getting deeper. Uh, Dr. Stetler already talked about technical challenges and, and opportunities in areas of drones and things like that. Uh, there are also opportunities for better efficiency. Can we do mining in a more efficient way through automation, through all kinds of different means? So those are some challenges we face. And of course, you know, the big thing, safety. You know, we talk about it, and I think we mean it. And there's a wonderful record here even in South Africa, just the decrease in fatalities in the mines. 1993, over 600 fatalities in South African mining uh, situations. In 2003, that was down to 270. 2013, under 100. Moving in the right direction, but you know, zero should be the target there. So safety is always a challenge, and it's something that we face. So what does that have to do with a company like Lockheed Martin? Well, Lockheed does and solves difficult problems in difficult places. That's what we do as a company. We've been in a 40-year partnership, really, with the, the petrochemical and mining industry. We like to say that we do difficult. And doing difficult means lots of different places. It means with different technologies. You know Lockheed maybe is an aircraft and a satellite and space company, but we also do quite a bit of work in the areas of sensors and instrumentation and materials. So that's our heritage. Things like Mars rovers are in our repertoire, Hubble Space Telescopes, the Orion crew capsule, and the uh, manned missions that are headed towards uh, Mars and beyond. So that's the, the pedigree that we have. But I just want to talk for a moment about maybe some of the connectivity between the things that are done in an aerospace company and what's done in mining. There are a lot of similar attributes. The first thing is just the, uh, the area of scale. The revenue generated by aerospace companies in 2014 was about $300 billion. That's on a similar scale to the mining industry. The mining industry was about $600 billion last year. So we're big industries. There's a lot of things that are going on. In addition, I think we're very uh, safety conscious and risk averse. I mean, we can't allow ourselves to get ourselves into situations where there are issues of safety or concerns for um, unacceptable results, both technically and economically. They're highly regulated industries, I probably don't have to tell you that, but um, in different ways we face a lot of constraints, a lot of pressures, a lot of challenges. They're also very technology-centric, we're technology-savvy industries. Aerospace, you think of all, all the whiz-bang things, there's a lot of neat, exciting things happening in the mining industry as well. And so there's a lot of connectivity and I think similar challenges. And of course, the harsh operating environments. We're not mining out in space yet, but the places that mining operations do happen are very difficult, you know, the remote deserts and places like that. So, so what's Lockheed's pedigree in these areas? Well, you've heard a little bit about gravity radiometers. We make sensors, that's true. We also have a strong portfolio in information technology, autonomous systems, both undersea and on land. A lot of applications there towards mining. Um, materials and structures, we do some pretty neat things with graphene, with uh, perforated membranes, with carbon nanotube solutions. Renewable energy solutions are a main part of one of our portfolios, which include marine hydrokinetic energy, ocean thermal energy, sort of things that are a little bit new and out of the box. The enterprise applications, and this is something where we take broad data sets, bring them together into some manageable, interpretable system so that you can actually do good things with the data that you have. So it's bringing all that together. And then some of the other things that we do relate to logistics and supply chains in, in hard environments. Uh, you may not know that Lockheed actually supplies all the logistics support for the McMurdo Station in Antarctica. And so we do places where it's cold, we do places uh, support things that are far out. So with all that said, we were talking about breaking barriers. So here's the personal question for you. What is the barrier that you're facing? What's the real challenge that you have? Maybe it's that your budgets have been cut. 
Maybe it's that you know, you're facing pressures from managers. Maybe it's that you just can't get into the target areas that you're after. I mean, that's what we want to wrestle with this week. We want to understand that, but I want to maybe extend that thought just a little bit. Beyond just breaking barriers, let's talk about maybe bridging barriers. How can we find ways to look at capabilities that might be relevant from other industries, bring them to bear, and help us to do a better job? So, as we think about the different things that are going on this week, not just breaking down barriers, but let's see how we can bridge them as well. So, I like to say that sometimes innovation is rocket science, but sometimes innovation and getting past our troubles and hurdles is just dialoguing with one another. So we don't need to bring in any spaceships this week, but I think in the interactions that we have, hopefully we can address some of the challenges and find solutions. So again, enjoy the conference. Let's see if we can break down some barriers this week. I want to thank the conference organizers. I want to thank them for putting together such a, an exciting technical program. And I'm looking forward to sharing the time with you this week. We're going to have some uh, coffee and tea now. So uh, thank you for listening and look forward to a great week with you. Thank you, Dan. Before we break away for coffee and tea, I've just got some additional heartbreaking, I mean, housekeeping rules. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, firstly, will all presenters please bring their memory sticks and videos to our AV team for loading onto laptops? If you are presenting in Summit, then please visit Cebu. Um, if you are presenting in Mom's Car or Itaba, then please visit Colin in the room next door. All those with refunds or outstanding balances due, please visit the registration booth in the exhibition hall. Geotech Airborne Limited is kindly sponsoring our happy hour this evening from 5 to 6 in Mom's Car during our post session. So please come and enjoy. The pool dry starts thereafter on the terrace. It is a chilly evening and we hope to sit outside. So please bring along a jacket or an extra layer of clothing. Our open bars will be providing beer, house wine, ciders, cool drinks and juice. Other beverages will be on a cash basis. There are cash machines at the store across the road or else if you're living at the venue, you could charge the drinks to your room. All morning and afternoon tea breaks and lunches will be held in Buttress, our exhibition area. Right, so that brings our closing address to a close, our opening address to a close, and marks the official opening of the Saga 2015 conference. I look forward to seeing you all during the course of the next three days and hopefully meeting, getting to meet many of you. Remember, umuntu, ngumuntu, ngabantu. A person is a person through persons. And that it is through our collaboration and teamwork that we can reach the pinnacle of our success. Thank you.